Hello and welcome back to the Agostino Zinger show with I, your host Agostino Zinger and this is episode number 624 I think. It should be 624. I'm pretty sure it's 624 and if it isn't 624 I do apologize but I'm pretty sure it is 624 of the Agostino Zinger show with I, your host Agostino Zinger and I hope you're doing well wherever this pod may find you. How am I? All good, all things considered. I've had a bit of a mad one in terms of, you know, the stuff I had to pack in today, in terms of the things I was needing to do from going to the gym, from going for a run, getting my hair cut, getting my hair did, because I got my hair braided underneath here, which is why I'm wearing this hat. Actually, as you can, can you see that a little bit there? I got this little condom hat thing going on, and I got my little hat on as well there, my little Moa Lola hat. Right? You remember? You, do you remember? Do you remember when this hat caused so much drama within, you know, high fashion Twitter and just Twitter spaces in general? Oh, look at that. It's all bent and stuff. You know, I haven't worn it since I bought it actually outside. Crazy, but because my hair's all mad. But yeah, this hat caused so much or caused so much drama. It was the it hat of the moment, of the scene, of the industry. And people wanted it. Everyone was clamoring for it. Moa Loa. Ma, Mo, Moa Loa. How, why, don't, why can't I even pronounce the brand name? It's Moa Lola, isn't it? It's not Mawa Loa. It's Moa Lola. Right. Yes. She was the toast of the town. Everyone was clamoring for her. The next hot thing out there in terms of the, the uh, designer. And, you know, she's still pretty much doing great things, I guess, now at the moment. I keep seeing new collections pushed out. So clearly the business has been somewhat handled behind the scenes. So that's great to see. But this was really interesting time because in the moment, it was such an important thing to get this hat. And, you know, the the, the lack of delivery, the lack of shipping, um, you know, the non answering of emails, the selling out quickly and stuff. It was mad how these were just flying out. You know, and people were going crazy for them. And then when I finally got mine in the flipping mail, it didn't come with any sort of protective packaging. It just came in some plastic sort of like, you know, real mail sort of envelope sort of thing you get. And also because it's a trucker hat, that obviously didn't help or work to its benefit because it all got, sorry, I keep smashing the mic. It all got bent up in the mail. I think I spoke about this when I first got it, but it all got bent up in the mail um, the shape of it isn't really the greatest in terms of suiting my head. It's more in the style of like a um, of a traditional dad hat in terms of the shape. I thought it'd be more of a trucker hat because if you know, trucker hats usually come a little bit more up here towards the front. And then, you know, this is the crown, I guess. It's a little bit higher, a little bit longer. I don't know how you say it. Maybe deeper, you mean. So this would usually come up to about there. The crown would be higher. It would be just a little bit more round. And it would suit my massive, you know, new era. Because the new era size hats, I wear, what, 7 and 5 eight. So I've got a huge dome. So usually I always go for trucker hats because those are the ones that usually can fit me. Or like old school snapbacks that are usually quite big. And they can fit my head. But when it comes to dad hats and this type of you know, shape of hat where it's sort of sloped back, you know, past the brim, it sort of angles backwards, which is what you'd get mostly with dad hats and camp cats and stuff that you'd get from Supreme. It doesn't normally fit. Um, the strap is a little bit whatever, you know. I usually like mine to have the double um, clips on it. I don't know if you've seen it before where it's got two lines of dots on it. I think they usually hold on your head a little bit better. The, the You know, the mesh on the trucker hat is a little bit coarse and not the greatest quality. And on the inside... There's no Moa Lola label, you know, and, you know, to, to, to borrow Steve Jobs uh, sort of design ethos where he was always obsessed with the inside of his products also looking as good as the outside, the stitching on the reverse of that embroidery isn't the best, is it? You would either cover it up so you don't see it or clean it up a little bit. The quality control is awful and it just doesn't look the great. So I think I must have paid like £40 for this and this is definitely one of those things that you pay for mostly because of the name mostly because of the hype mostly because of the you know the clout associated with it and the core factor but it's not exactly the best design piece i've seen the thing that's the best of it i think is definitely the logo she smashed it with the logo taking that classic sony walkman type logo and essentially flipping it upside down and turning it into her logo for her design of her brand sorry was genius 
and especially when you consider that we're living in this sort of like y2k obsessed trend thing that we're going on at the moment this kind of works really well even though i think she was doing her thing prior to that thing being a thing or that trend being a thing um i still think it's a really really good logo that will probably stand the test of time more so than the overall designs that they're doing nowadays but man at the time this hat was a big deal big big deal and i fought tooth and nail to get this i was on my phone refreshing and stuff adding stuff and then in the end i haven't worn this outside once and maybe i might wear it actually when i go out on a weekend but apart from that i haven't worn it outside it's all bent up and looks kind of horrible and just isn't the greatest hat ever to be completely honest and you know a little bit disappointing in that regard but hey these things happen i guess these things happen apart from that i've been fairly okay you know trying to keep myself um trying to keep my head above water as they say and ensure that i finish this week somewhat with a bang and so far it's going pretty much okay so i cannot complain i cannot complain but to begin the show i wanted to quickly touch upon some unfortunate news to kind of um follow up on what i spoke about previously regarding the sex positive kink party crossbreed has unfortunately decided to shut its doors permanently if you are aware i did share the story that allegedly the founder of crossbreed alex aka kiwi was alleged of being a little bit of a menace behind the scenes people were alleging him of all sorts of stuff um that you know with no, no more evidence has really come out of it but essentially he was basically you know his leadership was being called into question whether or not he was a good person was being called into question and maybe he was doing some things behind the scenes that people didn't like in terms of essay stuff and other bits and bobs that i don't want to get involved in and talk about because you know i don't really know much about it in terms of the allegations because unfortunately the meme page that was sort of spreading some of this news or collecting some of the accounts from various people who were accusing alex of what he was doing was unfortunately shut down so there's no real record to see what people were actually talking about all i got was like second and third hand sort of reportage but essentially kiwi was basically accused of somebody that was kind of larping as whatever identity that kiwi identifies i think kiwi's non-binary if i'm not mistaken and um and also people will call into question some things that are happening behind the scenes as in SA and all that stuff I mentioned prior. And at the time, which I thought was pretty good approach to dealing with this sort of stuff, especially when you compare it to what happened with Lost the Ferryman and that Asqueef guy, I thought the fact that Kiwi came out straight away or maybe the team at Crossbeam and said, hey, he's not involved for the moment, he stepped down, um, all the power and all the controls being handed over to the team, they're in control of it, but the next few parties we're going to put on pause until we kind of can come to a resolution as to what happened and how we can pro progress. I thought that was a good way to deal with it because I thought when it comes to the Lost the Ferryman issue, one of the major things things i thought was annoying about it even if that issue or even the allegation isn't true or whatever it may be i just thought it was kind of unfair of the founder of olops of foreign to just hang around and not basically relinquish control and separate himself from the label to give the artists a chance to thrive and do their thing because what in the midst of all those allegations i do remember seeing a few people being in the comments of certain artists from olops of foreign and basically hounding them as to why they haven't commented on what was going on with the founder of their label which is not really their position to do so i mean they, they, they don't they don't have to comment on it and it was unfair for the leader to sort of put them in that position so i thought the fact that kiwi came out and did hey uh, i'm gonna step back the control has been you know i'm gonna hand over the entire control of the operations over to a team i'm no longer involved i'm sorry blah 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 i thought that was pretty cool but i guess behind the scenes that didn't really fix anything and um it looks like or it doesn't look like they've kind of confirmed via their Instagram profile that Crossbreed is over and done with. This is courtesy of the Instagram profile and the story section. I don't think they posted it on their main feed. So it goes as follows. It is with great sadness that I announced that Crossbreed will be closing permanently. The team has made a decision that it is not possible to work with the Crossbreed brand further and as such I have to close the company down. I want to thank everyone who's been part of this past three years or last three years, sorry. Everyone no so this is what they said to continue there it is with great sadness that i announced that crossbreed will be closing permanently the team has made the decision that it's not possible to work with crossbreed brand further and as such i have to close the company down i want to thank everyone who has been part of the last three years everyone who has worked with us and everyone who danced words will never really be enough this community is so special and i hope that in time other spaces will grow too all tickets will automatically be refunded in the coming days the instagram page will be disabled tomorrow for any inquiries please contact contact 
crossbreedworld at gmail.com alex slash kiwi so a little bit of a sad way to end such an amazing i think party and community again i have to stress i'm not part of the kink scene in what's in any way shape or form it's not really my thing but i think i stumbled upon crossbreed at the beginning of the pandemic probably and i just like the fact that there was this platform available this space available for people that were into kink parties into sex positive parties and wanted to go somewhere where they felt safe and maybe where they could also kind of marry the best of both worlds like being into dance music and also being into the kink stuff and i thought that was pretty cool and i like their branding i like the how they took their pictures um i like the ethos behind it even though some of it was a little bit you know insufferable and a little bit self-absorbed and whatnot and not really self-aware i like the fact that they had a position in certain things and they stood on it sometimes you know they they did like to do an apology post all the time but i do like that they had strong position on certain topics and certain things involving consent involving you know um, representation and um, all that sort of stuff i thought it was pretty cool to see from them and i think in dance music overall because most club nights are just kind of the same thing it's just a flipping dj booth in the corner and a dark room and some lights and that's it the element of kink i think involved the element of play and um, the element of, of like textual exploration i feel like it's really interesting to kind of you know over laid that on top of just a regular sort of club night quote unquote i thought that was pretty cool and they even went a step further they had like you know safety officers they had particular sort of training or you know insights they could lend to security to get them to be able to deal with people who are coming to those parties so it's not make them feel uncomfortable i just thought it was an interesting sort of idea behind um a club night that i thought you never really see too often in london especially london being as boring and vanilla as it is i'm sure there was a scene already there before crossbreed you know started that's probably on the yellow ground and on a needs to know invite only basis but the fact that they were able to do at such a big level i thought was pretty cool that's obviously all positive and obviously for someone like myself who's not even involved in the scene for me to have such an affinity with it and to see the benefit that comes from it you can only imagine what it was like being a part of that whole scene the curious part about this whole comment i thought statement sorry from crossbreed is the first is the couple of lines in the second paragraph which says the team has made the decision that it's not possible to work with a crossbreed brand further and as such i have to close the company down that's really alarming and what that tells me is that potentially the accusations that were levied against alex are a bit more serious than i maybe had first um realized or maybe that even the community even understood the fact that the team themselves felt that there was no coming back from this and crossbreed couldn't in good conscience go out there again and be promoting parties and trying to insert themselves back in the community blah de, blah 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 even if alex did step away and completely relinquish control and gave it to a team to kind of manage and do as they please the brand has been tarnished to that extent and the other thing that's also concerning about it is that would there have been no clarification as to what the accusations were there's been no follow-up there's been no acknowledgement of it it's just been a blanket sort of hush hush let's keep this on a quiet and move on the move to kind of disable the comments on the instagram i thought was quite cowardly on their part i understand you don't want people to get abused and whatnot but there needs to be a platform or a space where they can be free and open discussion and the fact that crossbreed's account was really private anyway and they probably weren't accepting any new people as followers on their account in the last few weeks it would have been easy to manage the comments and to make sure that people weren't going being crazy and just to kind of let people essentially have a debate and talk openly about whatever acquisitions have been levied so that people can be aware of what's going on in the scene and any learnings can come of it can be applied to other parties going in the future because i think as grim as this is and as bleak as this is it's also a moment for people to step up and say hey you know that space or that place didn't do things correctly i i know that i can maybe do something a bit better i've got a community of people who need a place to go to that is a bit safe and i can learn from the mistakes that crossbreed have made and other parties are made and we can go and do things better so there's definitely an opportunity to do so because i'm sure there's a whole community of people at crossbreed who will be splintered all over the place but if they can kind of you know if someone can step up and sort of fill that void i think it'll be quite successful but i honestly do think there needs to be some clarification from the founder as to what exactly went on because i feel like it's not cool because if this happened to any other scene let's imagine i mentioned before if this happened in the, in a techno in a tech house scene you know or anything else that most people in the sort of techno and alternative avant-garde underground scene don't really like people will be spitting feathers that there hasn't been any accountability any owning up any 
any fronting of the allegations or explaining of what's been actually going on. It's all been very cloak and dagger type and it's been dealt in the background, which maybe is the best way to deal with it. Who knows? If you invite more voices, it may just muddy it. But I do feel like there needs to be a public acknowledgement as to exactly what went on so everyone could be clear as to what was going on behind the scenes so that these mistakes cannot be repeated, you know, going forward. And I feel like, you know, from the lessons that have been learned with the other place, what was the other one called? club verboten right the one that's moved back to berlin i think the founder was originally from berlin wasn't he i don't know anyway but i read an article recently it said where they moved to berlin because they kind of got fed up of dealing with the councils and the local you know whatever else it may be restrictions and regulations that come with trying to set up the one of those parties here in the uk or in london specifically so they do some parties here and there but for the most part they're basically based in berlin now so there's clearly a bit of a void to be filled there and i'm sure there's other parties that exist on an easterly basis so if you're into a scene you'll probably be aware of but it kind of is proof that regardless of what subculture you belong to regardless of what niche you belong to what community you belong to when it comes to nightlife you just have to be on your p's and q's you have to keep your head on a swivel you can't just assume because the people around you are into the same thing that you're into or come from the same community that they're going to be treating you with respect or you're going to be in a quote-unquote safe space you have to treat every space or every interaction you go into with some level unfortunately of skepticism of hesitancy of just you just have to always always question everything all the time every space you're in and never take things for granted or never take things for face value and ha allow places to build your trust and not always actually give them your trust and just think because this person says the right words or looks a certain way that automatically they're going to be do right by you because they clearly won't clearly clearly won't and it's also interesting to see that some of the prominent voices i mentioned beforehand that are involved in that scene some of them are following social media haven't said an absolute peep about this and like i said prior if this will happen in the tech house scene if this was something that occurred god forbid in the michael bibby party people would be going crazy do you know what i mean and the fact that no one is really addressing it or talking about it openly is a bit sus but who knows maybe there's some work being done behind the scenes that i'm not aware of because again i'm not part of that community so i don't know there's some stuff probably going on there that i'm not really kind of privy to who knows but overall it's a sad day in London nightlife because I think more of these sort of like because I think the the what's the thing called the the sort of delinquent the weirdo loves the fact that there's these kind of like you know Un, you know underground type of need to know parties that exist out there i think another nightlife needs it we need to have a kind of very tapestry of club nights that weave together that different people can go to and feel comfortable in and bloody blah, blah 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 and losing one i think is always a blow when it comes to the offerings that we have every single weekend personally for me and again also the people working behind the scenes there at crossbreed you know force and feelings go out to them because all of them are out of a job now effectively because of one person's mistakes or one person's wrong doing which i feel like is always something that's really really unfortunate in these situations where somebody can do a misstep and then everyone else has to basically suffer the consequences of it is really really hard to take so thoughts and feelings got with everybody that was working behind the scenes at crossbreed hopefully you all land on your feet and go on to do other great and big things going forward and lessons can be learned so that these mistakes cannot be repeated that's what we want to see that's what we want to see and then um, I wanted to talk about this, which is pretty bleak, to be honest. Sorry for the kind of tough topic to stop, to start the pod with. But this is courtesy of BBC News. And it happened a while ago, or a couple of days ago, sorry. And it's regarding Club Q in Colorado shooting. And it's pretty sad when you really analyze the details as to the shooter and the things that could have been done beforehand in order to ensure this occurred this occurrence had happened but i just wanted to cover the story regardless so this says here club colorado shooting attack was ended by a dad and show performer it says a father and a club performer managed to subdue a gunman who opened fire at an lgbt lgbt nightclub in the u.s state of colorado it has emerged the attacker killed five people and left 17 others injured at club q in colorado springs on saturday night the officials named the heroes who halted the attack as Ricard sorry as Richard Fierro and Thomas James without detailing their actions. Mr. Fierro provided an account of the events um, saying he tackled the suspect and took the weapon and hit them with it. It's not clear if Mr. James is the performer. Mr. Fierro says he stopped he stepped in to help. Um, at a Monday afternoon press conference police identified the victims as Daniel Ashton, Derek Rump, 
Kelly Loving, Ashley Powell, and Raymond Vance. Family members say Ashton and Rump were both bartenders at Club Q. Jesus Christ. The suspect named as police as 22-year-old Anderson Lee Aldrich is in police custody in hospital. The gunman was stopped by a 15-year U.S. Army veteran who was attending a performance at the club with his wife and daughter. Speaking to the reporters on a Monday evening, Richard Fierro said his combat training kicked in as he pounced on the gunman, pulling him to the floor by his body armor. I just ran over there. Got him. I'm thinking, I gotta kill this guy. He's gonna kill my kid. He's gonna kill my wife said the iraq and iran so the iraq and afghanistan veteran it's the reflex mr fiero said after from the front yard of a suburban colorado springs home go to the fire go go stop the action stop the activity don't let no one get hurt the local brewery owner said he and his family had dropped to the floor as the bullets began to fly he described seeing the government move in the direction of a patio where other club girls had fled before charging at him there are some of the pictures of the victims from left Daniel Ashton, Ashley Pugh and Derek Rump. Absolutely tragic, isn't it? He said the man dropped his rifle as he fell. They began to wrestle on the ground. Mr. Fierro said he snatched the attacker's pistol from him and used it to beat him. I kept wailing on him. Um, I'm a big dude and this guy was bigger. He told reporters that he urged a performer from the club to kick the attacker in the head. One of the performers was walking by and I told him to kick him in the head and she took her high heel and stuffed it in his face. Mr. Fierro said one of the dead included his daughter's boy friend oh my god jesus christ raymond vance Colorado Springs Mayor John Suthers hailed the bystanders incredible act of heroism. Yeah, if he didn't step in, that guy would have probably ended up killing way more people. He said that he had spoken to Mr. Ferrer on Monday telling reporters, I've never encountered a person who engaged in such a heroic action that was so humble about it. Uh, praise also came from the governor of Colorado as well as the owner of the club who said the heroes had probably saved lives. Police have are looking into who owned the rifle allegedly used in the shooting as well as the handgun the suspect was carrying at the time of his arrest. Investigations will determine whether the shooting which came in the eve of the Sunday's transgender day remnants was a hate crime and if the suspect acted alone. The suspect is facing five murder charges and five charges of committing bias, motivated crime causing bodily injury. According to US media, investigators said on Tuesday that no charges had yet been formally filed. Club Q has been described as the heart of the LGBT community in Colorado Springs, a city seven miles, 70 miles south of Denver. The suspect had reportedly previously come to police attention over alleged bomb threat in 2021. According to police report at the time, his mother had called emergency services saying he was threatening to cause harm to her with a homemade bomb multiple weapons and ammunition president joe biden said america cannot and must not tolerate hate in 2016 449 people were killed in a shooting of pulse gay nap club in orlando florida at the time it was the deadliest mass shooting in u.s history the thing that's really concerning about this is that having analyzed a little bit more of the story especially when it comes to the assailant it looks like he was under police watch what's that term that they use um, he was on their radar when it comes to him being a little bit, um, you know, a little bit of a crazy person, especially when it comes to the bomb threat that he, um, you know, did towards his mum. And the thing that's really crazy about it is that if he would have got charged for that bomb threat, he most likely wouldn't have been able to get a gun. And the fact that he wasn't and that his records were sealed basically made his ability to go and get a gun, just what I've read online, a lot easier. So what it's kind of proving is that although there is a probably... A, a debate to be had about gun control in the US. We all know this. This is pretty much obvious to say. There is also another debate that needs to be had for the lack of um the lack of due diligence and really the lack of uh the lack of people doing their job well when it comes to background checks and when it comes to the things that are already in place to make sure people who shouldn't be getting guns shouldn't get guns and the ones that can can. You know what I mean? It's that kind of situation. And the other unfortunate part of it also is the fact that this obviously targeted a vulnerable group of people who were, by all accounts, in a place that they called home, in a place that they felt safe in. And then you, you know, I think I read an account or listened to a guy who was hospital talking about how he heard the bullets, but so he heard the, yeah, he heard the gunshots, but to him, he just assumed it was balloons because they usually have a lot of balloons in that club and people step on them when they're on a nightclub. People do it all the time. I've been in clubs where people do it to kind of spook somebody. So he just, assumed it was balloons and it was only after about i think he said the seventh the seventh shot he finally realized oh no that's actually a gun so it took a while for everyone to realize that it was actually a gun which may have led to the number of deaths but it's also pretty astonishing to think that only five people died in a packed nightclub do you know what i mean in a place that's pretty small you would imagine 
you know, they're already that that guy who kind of saved a lot of people, the hero. He was there with his wife and his daughter. So clearly it's a place that a lot of people go to just for a drink anyway. It may, it may be one of the only bars in that small town that they live in that might be open to a certain time. So it's not even like only gay people go there. So it was probably pretty full on that night. So he went there on an extremely full night and only managed to kill five people. It's an absolute miracle. But the fact that five people anyway had to lose their lives in such a happy and joyous moment just breaks my heart man it really is one of the saddest stories i've read uh, you know this week on top of what obviously happened in walmart with that manager walking into his walmart and killing you know 10 of his flipping colleagues absolutely wild to see what's happening now in the world and um yeah man hopefully that guy gets buried under the jail and of course big up to the hero richard fierro for being a hero and stepping up and having balls to do so because in these situations it probably helps that he's a former army vet because he literally ran to dan ran to the danger i think any other person would have been trying to preserve their life and those around them and maybe would have froze in action or whatever it may be but it probably took somebody who was obviously in the army before to sort of help in that situation and defeat it and essentially what he did by his actions was that he was willing to put his own life on the line to save others which is something that you don't see a lot of people do so a bigger to Richard Fierro and you know hopefully he gets all the commendations needed and he has and he heals as well from this because it might be super super traumatic for everybody involved maybe not for him because maybe he's seen combat but I still think to be where in that sort of place and to have your daughter's boyfriend die right in front of you what that daughter's going through also I can't imagine man. I honestly can't imagine um, but yeah, prayers to everybody involved from the Club Q shooting and hopefully justice is served. Hopefully justice is served. Another thing I wanted to quickly talk about is the ongoing drama with concerning Elon Musk at Twitter, which I think is pretty interesting to view from the outside looking in. Because as much as there's a lot of negative around it, oddly enough, having worked in a bunch of startups and no, you know, and kind of having a bit of a pulse on what's going on with some of the founders, having read a few books and listened to a few podcasts and watched a few documentaries and just had a general interest in the startup scene. It's interesting to see how the press and the mainstream media are reporting on these issues going beyond seeing because as you know, heartache breaking as it must be if you're a Twitter employee to have a job one day and then not have it because this your new boss comes in and he's a bit of a maverick, a little bit of a loon, and he decides on a whole new parameters in terms of how you do your job. He just he demands you to kind of work in the office. He demands you to send him code to review. All these sort of things come in place which weren't in place prior when you were there, but now all of a sudden your job your safety net is completely gone, and now you're on your ass because someone this one guy basically is coming and changed all the rules. I understand that's a stressing, but having worked in many startups. One of the main things that I always was aware of was that as soon as you get bought out, you essentially have to anticipate that your job could be gone because the person that's buying you out might have their own vision for the company, which usually leads to the founders leaving because, you know, if you're a founder and you bootstrap the company, it's very difficult to then take you know, advice or notes from essentially your boss if the other company decides to buy you out, which is why they usually leave. And also your subordinates or your employees might also find it difficult to work for this new management structure because they are not used to it or because the demands are too much or whatever. Or it's not a right cultural fit. It happens quite often. But for me, I've never been under any illusion. If somebody buys out the company I'm in or if there's a new managerial structure or new people come in to kind of just manage the company and to lead it, whatever it may be, I have to assume that my job could also be in jeopardy and I have to make adjustments and to make sure that I'm okay. But I thought this was quite interesting, this recent update. It says Elon Musk says Twitter is done with layoffs and is ready to hire again. Twitter had nearly 7,500 employees before Musk took over. Now it has about 2,700. After purging nearly two-thirds of Twitter's 7,500 person workforce in the three weeks, Musk is hiring again. During an all-hands meeting with Twitter employees today, Musk said that the company is done with layoffs and is actively recruiting for roles in engineering and sales and that employees are encouraged to make referrals according to two people who attended a, per, uh, a partial recording obtained by The Verge. His comments were made at the same day that an unspecified wave of cuts hit Twitter's sales department, which has lost almost all of its senior leadership since Musk took over. Another thing to kind of pull from this is that if I'm sure a lot of people who left from that 7,500 were people who left because they're, they're ideologically opposed or politically opposed to Musk's worldview, or they just don't like him as a person, or they maybe thought it was a great time to leave. But a lot of these people have also left because they were being, 
you know, unmanageable. They were being flipping rude to the boss on Twitter, which was crazy to see, especially after he fired the first couple of people. I think maybe in the beginning, if you didn't know and you wanted to razz Elon on Twitter while being a Twitter employee, cool. But after you saw two or three people get publicly fired, if that was me and I was working there, I would maybe kind of fall in line and kind of just, you know, acquiesce and be like, okay, cool. I understand this guy's wiling a bit. Let me play the game. Let me gather myself. Let me not be too crazy or too hasty and kind of keep moving because I want to make sure I squeeze as much money as I can out of these people before I eventually do get fired. Or you just want to behave to just keep your job in general. I didn't really completely understand that going forward, but it is a pretty bad indictment on the Twitter workforce, right? And the team that basically Jack Dorsey built before he left that only that only 2,000 sorry only 2,700 of them are left so essentially from the ones that left because they wanted to leave and the ones that got fired it, it basically proves that there wasn't many employees there worth keeping so they were all kind of just you know collecting a check um just for the sake of it because they've been there a long time but they weren't essentially earning their living in any kind of meaningful way and they didn't exactly make themselves indispensable when the new leadership took over which is pretty alarming must didn't specify the kinds of engineering or roles um, twitter was hiring for and the company doesn't currently have any open role listed on its website in terms of critical hires i would say people who are great at writing software are the highest priority he said during the meeting the verge reported last week that twitter recruiters were already reaching out to engineers asked them to join twitter 2.0 and an elon company monday's all hand was the first time twitter's employees heard from us since he required them to all opt in to stay to his extremely hardcore cultural reset which led to roughly 1,000 resignations last week while fielding employee questions for about an hour, half an hour from Twitter San Francisco head office uh, Musk said that there were no plans to move Twitter's head office to, Twitter, to Texas like he did with Tesla but it could make sense to build dual headquarters in California and Texas the funny thing about all of this is that I'm sure there are plenty of people falling over themselves to apply for Twitter 2.0 and to be part of this company. Because essentially, if Elon ends up doing everything that he's promising to do in terms of turning Twitter into a place where content creators like myself can maybe earn some money and create content, maybe he can turn it into a place where people can safely send cryptocurrency or other currency to each other. Maybe it turns into a place where, you know, news is somewhat credible or whatever else it may be the verification thing all of that community building it would be absolutely incredible to see in real time and if you're part of that just imagine what that could do to your cv imagine what that could do to your career and you just imagine how exciting and fun it will be to be part of that entire process so as bad as as bad as the pr has been for twitter over the last few weeks and elon maybe hasn't necessarily ingratiated himself with some people out there i still think that there are people who will look at that and think that's a cool challenge to kind of get my teeth into i know i would if i could do software or program whatever it may be i would be flipping first in line applying for a job there because the chances of it working out are maybe slim but if they do god almighty what a great thing to have on your jacket that you was one of the people responsible for leading twitter 2.0 for playing an instrumental part into making this app go to the next level that would be interesting and pretty impressive to see so that's the only concerning thing i think about this whole thing all the bad pr has been one thing and maybe people seeing a different type of leadership in startup world which you don't usually see most startup world is people walking around the office bare bare you know barefooted um you know sitting down on flipping bean bags a lot of hacky sack table tennis free snacks free lunches and dinners and those kind of facebook day in my life you know facebook employees day in my life videos kind of ring to mind but elon musk kind of turns it on the head and does business maybe the old school way in terms of how he runs his companies he wants people to work hard he wants us to stay late he wants them to all be in the office um he's not a fan of you know unnecessary perks and what not just for the sake of it to make people happy he wants everything to be performance based so it's a very kind of throwback way to do a business and to be an entrepreneur especially in the world we're living in now where people are essentially leading with their feelings so it's pretty cool to see what you work in real time or not work in real time and like I said, I'm pretty sure there's going to be plenty of people falling over themselves wanting to apply to get on board with that going forward. Next, I want to mention this news regarding Iggy Azalea selling her catalogue to Domain Capital in an eight-figure deal. 
she decided, I think, in this one fell swoop to effectively, unofficially retire from music, which I think she mentioned before. She was already saying that she wants to kind of retire and just be a mum and do other business ventures, which makes some sense. But I do think this is pretty cool because I do remember her also saying once in an exchange with people on Twitter that, she writes a lot for people like she's behind the scenes doing a lot of writing for artists that we would know now here and now but she kind of keeps that all to close to chest because it's something she doesn't want to divulge because it kind of pays a pretty penny and obviously that whole entire world is especially um quite secretive in terms of who people write for because the people that she writes for i guess don't want people to know that they have writers they want to kind of have this illusion that they kind of write everything themselves but regardless i think this is a really good move especially when you consider how you know streaming is effectively being rendered mute it's obviously helping in terms of statistics and numbers especially once you get into the higher echelons but for what i would deem to be a quote-unquote working musician or artist which is what i'll describe someone like an iggy because she's not exactly red hot relevant in the industry but she still probably has a decent enough catalog to you know pay a mortgage or a couple of light bills and stuff which is pretty decent but for a working class, I guess, artist and musician to be in a position where you can sell your catalog for an eight figure deal, that is monumental and something that you should obviously rip the person's hand off if they decide to offer you such a deal, because it probably is a once in a lifetime opportunity. And like I said before, with streaming being the way it is, there's no guarantee that it's going to stay the way it is in terms of how they report the numbers in terms of what the numbers do in equating money you know what what royalties all that good stuff it could or even masters could be rendered mute in sometimes in the future if another development technological comes across so or kind of evolves from time so i think this is a really really smart play from iggy in terms of securing her long-term future and obviously giving her the ability to kind of position herself in certain places so it says the follows iggy zayde has sold her master recording and published catalog to domain capital for an eight-figure sum a source close to the deal told billboard the wide-reaching deal includes 100 percent of igazelia shares of her existing catalog including her number one hit fancy featuring charlie xcx black widow featuring rita rita aura and problem featuring ariana grande yo those are free big records and it includes an additional trigger for Azalea to earn future revenue on master recordings the deal was brokered by a manager Reese Pearson and her attorney Peter Paterno the rapper's discography includes the new classic Surviving the Summer EP and In My Defense and In the End of an Era though she has previously released music under the deals with Virgin EMI and Island Records Azalea has since founded her own label called Bad Dreams um, it was formerly distributed by Empire but is now in the midst of closing a new distribution deal with a different firm The Source says so she's even got she's doing some boss shit the independent rapper who owns 100% of her her bad dreams label she will be able to fully own her masters and publishing on all four coming music starting Q1 2023 on the publishing side she has an administrative deal with Sony publishing with Sony music publishing sorry these days your Sherlyn native is living in Miami and working on her next album raising her son Onyx whom she welcomed in 2020 she plans to release a full project sometime next year oh yeah the Miami move might be to do with Tory Lanez isn't it or maybe she was there that's how she met Tory Lanez but I remember he said he's trying to executive produce that album also but I'm assuming he's probably keeping that in a hush now to do with his court date and once that gets you know concluded they're probably going to ramp up the promo and start really being out there and pushing it I'm curious to say to listen to what happens with that deal actually Azalea's deal was revealed just weeks after Domain Capital announced that it had closed more than 700 million in commitments for a comical entertainment fund in the press release about the fund on November the 1st, Domain Capital added that it had already deployed more than 170 million in film, television and music investments to date. We're excited to launch our first ad diversified private entertainment royalty fund, said an Anthony Tega, <laughs> oh what a name, Anthony Tita Negro, Tita Negro, mamma mia. <laughs> executive managing director of um, Domain Capital Group in the release at the time of the sustained entertainment industry, um, growth certainly should be growth supported by the ever-evolving landscape of distribution channels we are focused on building a diversified asset base to generate cash yield and help maintain our investors capital the firm declined billboard's request for comment so like i said before great deal for iggy i think she absolutely smashed it so congratulations to her for securing the bag as per usual i think it'll go a long way to securing her long-term future obviously for someone like herself who's 
clearly been angling to kind of get out of the music industry and kind of retire i think that's cool also because i don't think we see that often enough people just bowing out gracefully maybe she's not at the top but she still bowed out gracefully she wasn't out here struggling to fill certain venues and arenas and trying to make that work and trying to go back on a radio circuit again and you know basically subjecting herself to these terrible interviews that essentially paint her in a terrible light even though for the most part she does come across pretty decent she's obviously raising her son that she's got with playboy car and she's seems pretty unproblematic for the most part of it so if you are in the music industry and you're kind of tired of things and you don't want to compete with everybody else and do the things people have to do in order to keep yourself somewhat relevant then if you have the ability to sell your catalog and still have the ability to do your writing behind the scenes work on your label that is obviously the deal and it's definitely going to be a life-changing amount of money and she's already said that herself on twitter when she said the following um where somebody asks us on twitter and said i hope she doesn't end up like taylor um no shade at all just using it as an example and Igazela replied back and said Taylor did not profit from the sale I sold a portion of my catalog which is very important to who I wanted for an amount that means I don't have to work another day in my life which is incredible I love y'all down but the master's conversation is a little beyond most of your understanding of business which I definitely agree the master's conversations and you know the whole premise behind it is that if you own 100% of nothing then what do you actually own so this idea that masters are everything is very very much a fan's point of view or maybe something a lot of artists have been pushing and the fans basically have run with it but the music industry business is very shady it's very convoluted and there are ways if you want to make a lot of money but but from the impression of kind of average everyday consumers when they see the stories out there it kind of looks like you've been swindled when really you decided to make the better play out of everyone so big up her and i hope it works out for her going forward i really really do moving on from that i want to touch upon these so corny original relaunches the ultra retro pro grid triumph for one of the worst names possible um ever you could put for a sneaker i think the opening image itself with these horrendous combat pant things with is that a smiley face button no it isn't my bad it's just my eyes are eyesight is absolutely terrible i thought that was a smiley face button but regardless it's got these awful flipping pants that look like you can roll them up and clip them underneath which is obviously horrible but the shoe itself i think is pretty interesting and cool and it got me thinking overall why don't more people try and make uncool sneakers like sakoni way more cooler than going out there and buying the same thing everyone else is wearing everyone at the moment is wearing those solomon boots or solomon trainers the ones that people wear to do like hiking and cross country training and whatnot but i think i think it's far more valuable it's far more interesting and it's way more fun to pull a shoe that no one's really looking at or caring for and try to bring that into some sort of relevancy and get that to be the hype new thing and especially in my opinion especially someone who kind of cares a lot about not wearing stuff everyone else is wearing it just kind of mixes up mixes things up a bit because these aren't asics these aren't diodoras or mizunos or even new balances right these are sakornis you don't see anybody nowadays wearing sakornis and wearing them proud and i feel like this model is really cool i like the colorways I like the shape. I like the little details of the mesh. I like the little hits of the blue here and there. And of course, the colors are super classic. I guess maybe they're probably an OG colorway that they brought back in terms of the free colorway kind of rule that I say is usually king in terms of the base, the accents, and some of the linings. I think that's pretty much cool. If I can see that previous picture, it looks like the tongue is mesh also all over it. So it's a really cool design, very breathable, looks very light, looks very comfortable. And clearly, I feel like it's in line with all the shoes that are out there that are being popular but like i said it's not the in thing to wear at the moment so corny isn't the it brand it's kind of languishing behind asics it's probably languishing behind mizuno and it's definitely languishing behind new balance but in my opinion i think these look far more interesting so i wonder why these kids nowadays don't try and pluck these uncool quote-unquote shoes and try and make them cool why just wear the same thing everyone else is wearing why look at what asap now is wearing just want to buy the exact same thing if you count yourself to be a bit of a tastemaker or be a bit of an influencer why not do a bit of digging rummaging and taking of a risk and trying to make this work and trying to freak this with an outfit why not it really really puzzles me with that regard but anyway so corny um originals let's read the article courtesy of hypebeast this season so corny originals offers up an eclectic range of sneaker styles from luxe classics to futuristic steppers oh awful word to use in the article futuristic steppers 
amongst the autumn 2022 collection the brand adds a naughty favorite the pro grid triumph 4 returning with its new technical components and updated colorways providing the same maximalist sporty look as its 2007 predecessor the pro grid triumph 4 models a chunky silhouette with a striking all over mesh on top of the thick webbing and durable leather overlays with a chrome finish that are kept intact adding to the retro feel of the sneaker yeah definitely does have a retro feel to it and now again like i said this is up there with whatever kiko collaboration people are creaming themselves over and i feel like it looks a lot more interesting a lot more original than those sort of things and definitely doesn't make you look like a sheep because everyone else is wearing the same thing you're wearing um delivering the functionality as well as a style the new iteration of the cushioned um the, the new iteration is cushioned with progre technology that supports wearers in every terrain another technical another technical addition includes a lightweight arch lock material sewn across the media panel for the release of corny produces an impactful creative campaign that draws in the sneakers new age return with a glimpse of the retro performance this feels like it's been paid for yeah i knew it without even reading it i should have checked it out this is presented by the corny as i said this phase this feels like a paid for job and then you look at here presented by Sakoni without any sort of confusion the Sakoni originals pro good triumph 4 is available to buy now in the us and uk and italy in Sakoni stores or select retail stores so as i mentioned prior why don't kids take more risk i don't know maybe it's a whole diff it's a whole different view of kind of buying sneakers and what cool means because for me, when I was coming up, it was a far smaller scene. The influences still exist. The people that who got seeded stuff or the people that were looked at to be the tastemakers or the one that quote unquote set the trends. But for me and the way that I was kind of introduced to sneakers, it was always about buying stuff that no one had. That didn't mean they had to be limited edition. It didn't mean they had to come in a wooden box or you had to, you know, find them in some flipping mum and pop store. It could be anything that you actually just genuinely liked that you pulled um, or that you ended up picking up or stumbled across in terms of randomly shopping in different places. It was never about being limited edition. Then I think over time, once Nike recognized how fervent and how cash rich and, you know, how eager that fan base was to buy stuff, they decided to make stuff specifically for sneakerheads, which I think is what, you know, led i guess to the overall demise of sneakerhead culture overall because the limited edition shoes by them for the most part aren't that great and the way that they distribute them or sell them isn't the greatest you think of the sneakers app you think of the hey, that's confirmed app you think of the lack of cues in general you think of the backdooring it's all a bit of a shit show so if anything even with the global sneaker industry being a billion dollar market I feel like there should be more scope and there's more opportunity to sort of grab interesting GR type shoes and make those things cool or make or kind of in you know uh pull those into your style and what you're going to wear as opposed to kind of wearing the same old aj ones that everyone's wearing the same solomon boots the same architect arteryx gear the same new balances the same nike air maxes the same jordans the same sbs it just gets boring after a while the same hey that's the sambas now that everyone's wearing it's just boring for me but you know maybe i don't really know what i'm talking about when it comes to this sort of stuff talking about sambas we have to of course speak about pharrell's human race samba collections that are due to come out very soon or have already come out and i think they look pretty spectacular maybe this is kind of an overall samba celebration because i think we've seen quite a few iterations of them we've already seen what um i forgot what the ones that everyone's going crazy over the brown ones i think they're was are they were wells bonner i think the wells bonner sambas have really have done pretty well um there's others as well that i've seen from i think from iraq and why did a, a pair of sambas that are just basically the classic version with just their name or their brand story written next to the free stripes as human race has done and there's obviously the sporty and rich ones that i've featured before on this podcast so it's clearly been a concentrated or concerted effort from adidas to push the sambas i don't know if it's an anniversary or whatever it may be or this is just a shoot that they're trying to have a stan smith moment with as you remember a few years ago stan smiths basically came back into the zeitgeist and became a very popular sneaker again through a very um strategic and purposeful effort from the people over the adidas originals to bring them back and make them a thing so 
where maybe it feels like they're doing the same thing with these Adidas Sambas. And I, for one, really like Sambas. I wish I could wear them. My feet at the moment are a little bit wide, they're a little bit big, they're a little bit chunky. That's why I maybe don't fit in shoes that are so slim, that have such a low profile and are a bit pointy, don't necessarily work for me. But I've always loved this kind of indoor soccer shoe type of aesthetic. It's something that I've always kind of, you know, um, you know, um, been drawn to especially when i think of some of the earlier sbs some of the fcs that came out back then which i still love to this day which i'm upset they don't kind of come and bring back out again you know made famous by the likes of um what's his face that has uh bianca shandon alex olsen and the other guys or gino something he was also very famous for wearing um astro turfs and of course jason dill in that kind of regard so these have always kind of held a special place in my heart when it comes to shoes so these are the collection let's put this up into four screens we can kind of browse through the first point of contact that i like is the fact that afarel kept the long original tongue on the sambas i think a lot of people kind of cut them or make them short i know that's what happened with the sporty riches i think the wells bonners are really long also and i think some people obviously cut them to make it shorter but i think this is the look that you should be going for anyway sambas look better with the longer tongue whether or not you got them underneath a jean or you got them in front flapped over like some football boots i think they look cool like that so i'm a big fan of that and of course the colorway is banging you've got essentially a classic white and black colorway with a nice sort of suede um tip here in the front which is kind of classic for a samba um leather body black stripes and a gum outsole you can't really go wrong with that for the most part the laces look a little bit long maybe it's a one little thing i'd say with it the laces look a tad long for the shoe that you're wearing in terms of it being so small in terms of being them being so low to the proper and having so less and have not having that many eyelets the lacing of course is horrendous it's something that's always bothered me when it comes to sneakers anyway um brands don't necessarily lace up their shoes correctly but that's something i'll speak about another day but i feel like the shape overall looks pretty cool but looking at them from the top down they don't look as pointy as i remember them to be they look a little bit more squared off so maybe i could fit my gigantic uk 10.5 foot into them who knows but i do like the look of them overall i'm a big fan that black and white pair is or the black and gum sole pair is really nice it's got like a gray tip it's an all black body with an all gum outsole and it looks really really spectacular i love this little hair at the front with a little gray hair i think once you wear them in and scuff them a bit that will look really cool as well personally for me and that leather quality is also something to marvel at isn't it that looks like it's really really high quality leather so i do anticipate these maybe being a little bit more expensive than your regular samba and if i'm not mistaken is what do you call that what do you call that when they kind of seal the the what do, what do you call that uh the finish on the edge it's not a raw edge you know usually on the panels they cut them and it's kind of like fraying it looks like it's been sealed or maybe it's a leather but it looks like it's been sealed so it looks a bit yeah it looks like it's been kind of sealed or some way so maybe i expect these to be a little bit more expensive than the irregulars and if i'm not mistaken they look like they might be black wax laces or something so do ex maybe anticipate these being quite high when it comes to retail but i think both pairs look really cool so far from what i've seen i'll definitely wear these within a heartbeat then comes the clothing which i'm not necessarily a fan of it kind of looks like foot looker gear you've got human race kind of written across a polo with some stripes on it you've got a nice track jacket type thing affair a yellow type of track jacket affair which looks pretty nice and again with the human race logo on the back of it not for me personally it's a little bit you know a little bit lame you've got a long sleeve polo top as well that might be the best piece of it from the collection overall i think long sleeve polo is quite nice in terms of its look and what it fits like it looks like it's got like an elongated arms and the body's quite short you've got the polo again and these stripes with these bright colors the shorts look pretty nice um what's what's the material i don't think it's a suede it looks like some sort of maybe a polyester i'm not too sure the human race logo here maybe that's in 3m not really too sure either but again the shorts not for me personally so far i've only liked the long sleeve polo and then it got the pants look pretty cool the pants on the track jacket i like and i do like the fact that they're not an elasticated hem and they're not like an elasticated hem at the bottom it's just sort of like a wide uh pant that you would kind of be used to wearing from a brand like needles and whatnot so i do like how those kind of turned out i'm not gonna lie but overall solid collection they come in yellow also solid collection i think obviously the sambas in this um Ferro adidas human race collection is the highlight and i think both will definitely sell out quick 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 fast when they do become available so 
um, starting from the article here, it's got a second paragraph because the first is always waffle. It says, coming in night grey and core black and cloud white and night grey, the simple contrasting colorways of the samba are rendered in premium leather and suede. Detailing comes in the form of a lengthened soccer boot style molded leather and zigzag tongues, along with the samba and human race embossed markings. Additional brandings come in the form of a three stripes on the midfoot and heels, rounding the design of the shoes as the matching laces and a gum rubber sole units. Accompanying the Adidas Human Race sam Samba Night Grey and Cloud White is a section of ripstop jackets. Oh, it's ripstop that material. Okay, cool. Knit jerseys and shorts and apparel styles brings together the elements of Adidas rich football history and it's decorated with puff print details. The Adidas and Human Race Samba collection will be available from December 2nd. Oof. So get your fingers on the trigger because these are going to sell out. I may try and get a pair. I'm not sure which. I could probably won't want to get both. I'll probably try and get the blacks if I'm actually going to try. Maybe the blacks might be the best way to go, yeah, because obviously I like I love black shoes, but I don't really have enough of these kind of white type shoes either. Not too sure what I should get, black or the whites. Probably the whites and it might be the best way. No, actually, maybe the blacks. I may, may go for the blacks. I'm not too sure, but I'll, I'll decide when they come around. But yeah, December 2nd, Pharrell Adidas Samba Collection or the Human Race Pharrell Adidas Samba Collection, wherever you want to put it. December 2nd, watch out for those when they do come out. Watch out. So, full transparency, there was a time in my life where I was considering freaking a pair of Uggs. I wanted to, the vision I had in my head was to buy a pair of distressed vintage jeans, especially Levi's, maybe yellow tag Levi's, maybe red tag, it depends, and have them really be wide and baggy, really distressed and ripped, and have them just sitting on top of a pair of Uggs that are completely brand new with a nice denim jacket and a white t-shirt. Just essentially elevating and taking the Ugg from being the standard footwear that most chavvy girls wear when they want to go to the flipping offy run and elevating it to a level where it kind of turns into a streetwear luxury type of item that I can wear day to day and maybe even take it out there into the clubs and have something soft and warm and fuzzy on my feet. But obviously that didn't happen. But I do think this collaboration between Shane Oliver of Hood by Air fame and Ugg might be one of the best iterations I've seen of an Ugg in recent times. And maybe a good excuse for me to finally pull the trigger and get these Uggs into my wardrobe and start freaking them with my outfits because I absolutely love what Shane did with Uggs here. I really, really do. It's not Uggs, it's, I think it's Ugg. But anyway, let's continue. So this shoot features a pair of Uggs that Shane Oliver has decided to upgrade and turn essentially into a quasi faux motorcycle boot cowboy type boot type affair it's a pretty interesting way to sort of look at an ugg uh, something that you would again say is not something that you would first think of in terms of plowing the fields in terms of being a rugged boot that you'd wear on the horse or that you'd wear on the back of a quad bike or a motorbike he's essentially turned them into that or even something that would be you would kind of attribute to be a stepper a boot that would maybe be worn by a foot soldier or something think this is what he's turned it into and it's pretty incredible to see this um you know like done on a on a silhouette like an ugg or like on a shoe like an ugg but he's taken something really soft and turned it into something really really tough which i kind of like to be honest i'm really really a big fan of these um they're going to be the quiet taste because they do look kind of kind of naughty um, they maybe will be quite a challenge for most people to wear because like I said they do look like something that you would maybe ascribe to being a classic sort of motorcycle boot with this sort of shin guard and this sort of uh, four foot flap thing going on in the front here that kind of flips up you've got the Shane Oliver branding here embossed on the side but I do like them they kind of remind me in a weird way also of those Balenciaga motocross boots that are obviously inspired by motocross boots themselves but they do have this similar kind of vibe to them but I do like the fact that they kind of all monochrome all one color so they're all blacks and they got all whites no crazy accents maybe they will come in the second season when these do really well but i do like how these effectively look and then you've also got a high version and you've also got a low version in the classic sort of shape with that strap and the territory and look all over them but i think these are going to be really successful i think people are going to be all over these i feel like these will end up resonating with a lot with the fashion crowd and i think it will also resonate with a lot with the people who are generally fans of uggs in general i think they'll look at these and be like 
like, hey, these are pretty interesting. These are pretty cool because I'm sure there are a community of people out there who are still wearing Uggs, even though they're not the most trendiest of shoes to wear nowadays. And most people have kind of run away from them or maybe wear them in hiding. I'm sure there's still a huge customer base of people who like to wear these things day to day. I feel like Crocs has kind of taken Uggs as shine, especially when it comes to cool collaborations. But I love these. I think these are really, really well, well done. And it's also coming off the back of that really cool collaboration that they did with Denim Tears. Those are a little bit, you know, expensive in terms of price range but in terms of what they did with them in terms of the messaging in terms of the inspiration behind the materials used and what they look like they're again another cool iteration or example of how to kind of do an art collab but i feel like these by shane oliver really take them up another notch these are really really well done i'd love to see them in hand and i definitely 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 would wear these 100 percent. i feel they look absolutely banging they can't all the way to your flipping knee in terms of the higher ones which i'm obviously a big fan of the blacks i'd wear immediately and I could definitely see Kanye sticking his skinny jeans into these and wearing them alongside all the other high boots that he's wearing nowadays. I definitely can see that going forward. But I love these, man. I think these look really, really cool. Again, maybe I'm in the minority with these and people are going to be shouting at me in the comments in general. But I really am a big fan of these. Um, this, this is the article courtesy of Hypebeast. Let's, of course, skip to the second paragraph as per usual. Featuring two footwear styles, the capsule, this UGG collaboration between Shane Oliver includes the low, how do you call that? Armorite sabatons and the tall amorite greaves appearing in a classic hues of white and black the shoes are donned with a club like design with panelled legs and a perforated leather upper and foot fasteners the shoe comes as complete with the upcycled wool and lyocell sock liner and removable toe cover and outer shaft oh you can remove it all interesting um, it says he has a quote I like the idea of playing with a tradition and pushing it to the extreme levels and I guess a huge part of the language I'm extremely pleased to be pursuing. Being able to put this very comfortable thing within the world that I'm building feels interesting. 100% agree. Did they change the sole unit or is that the same sort of soft sole unit that after a few wears completely deteriorates and turns into sponge? I think it's the same one. Um, check out the real the offering and accompanying campaign the gallery above the UGG collaboration is now available in UGG stores okay it's available to purchase right now if you want so definitely go and check those out if you want but I definitely I'm a big fan of these I'm actually curious to see what the price of these is actually let's see um, UGG UGG Shane Oliver let's see how much these are actually going for I'm curious to see the price they're going for currently. Oh, it's a pre-launch. They're not available just yet, it looks like. Look, this is, this is a pre-launch courtesy of the official UGG website. So it looks like Hypebeast lied once again. No fact checking as per usual with that establishment. Yeah, see, they're releasing in six days, they're releasing on the 1st of December. Um, have we got an idea on the price so far? No idea on the price. We have no bloody idea, but for sure they're going to be releasing on the 1st of December so keep an eye out for them if you are interested they will eventually come out and you will be over the moon when you put your feet in them when you put your feet in them so that will be it of the Actors English Show episode number 623 thank you so much for tuning in it's been a pleasure to have your company as per usual if it's your first time tuning into the show you know what to do follow me on all the socials the website is there for you to check as well if you need and um, the link is in the description of the show and i'll see you guys again very very soon in it